Exodus chapters 19 and 20 records the Hebrews being offered the Sinai covenant. In 19, 3 through 6, Moses went up and God gave him a summary of what was coming to give to the people. God had defeated the Egyptians and brought them to this mountain. His kingdom intentions for Israel was that they be an obedient, covenant-keeping kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If anything was postponed from this era, it is this. For Peter and John later applied the same language to the New Covenant people. As we will see later, the earthly monarchy would be Israel's idea after being settled in Canaan, and not a good one, for it was based on a desire to copy their pagan neighbors and was a rejection of God's heavenly rule. In verses 7 and 8, Moses called the elders and summarized to them what was coming, and the people agreed to obey God and be his people. In verses 9 through 25, God would come in an impressive way. Mount Sinai or Horeb would be wrapped in smoke, thunder, lightning, earthquakes, and a loud trumpet. They would hear his voice. So the people had three days to consecrate themselves, and barriers were set up so people would not break through to see God. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke, because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard, and still live? Out of heaven he let you hear his voice and on earth he let you see his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. In chapter 20, the Hebrews heard God's voice speaking the core of the Sinai covenant, the ten words, or the Decalogue, or ten commandments, from the fire. This is near Fares. Cairo Action News, on assignment with the Hebrews now camped at Mount Sinai. Their leader, Moses, has brought them here to make a covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Something is happening. have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any graven images. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Wow! The Hebrews' God is God. This is Nia Fares, Cairo Action News. In Exodus 20, 18 through 20, rather than break through to see or draw near to hear God as the intended kingdom of priests, when the people heard God's voice speaking the covenant core, they retreated in fear and did not want to hear God's voice again. Moses told them that they should not be terrified of God, 
but have an awesome respect for God that would discourage them from sinning. For the rest of the covenant regulations and legislation, Moses would have to go up to God and receive the information alone. In Exodus 20, 21 through 23, 33, following the Ten Commandments that all heard, God provided more to Moses in what came to be known as the Book of the Covenant. We'll look more closely at these things in a later video. In Exodus 24, the Sinai Covenant was confirmed. Before the people heard God's voice, they had agreed to keep the covenant. After hearing God's voice speak the ten words, the requirements of the covenant were laid before them a third time. Then blood was mixed with water, and as the people passed before him, Moses splattered them all with covenant blood, and they were in a covenant relationship with Yahweh. They were now in line for the covenant blessings, but also now liable for the covenant curses. So rebellion after this point will result in plagues and punishments. Moses, Aaron and sons, and seventy elders went up, saw, and ate with God's visible presence. Since God's voice scared the people, Moses had to go up, hear, and record the bulk of the legislation alone and this occurred several times. It was, apparently, during the second session, lasting forty days, that some thought Moses was dead or had abandoned them. So they determined to make a golden calf, an apis bull, and return to Egypt. Aaron joined in quickly, organized the project, and even pressed the gold leaf onto the image with his own hands. The declaration that the golden calf was Israel's god would later be repeated when Jeroboam set up two golden calf idols. For biblically ignorant Israelites, this sounded biblical. It just ignored the original context and was wrong the first time also. In Exodus 32, 7-24, God sent Moses back down to get control of things. First, he threw down the two stone tablets of the covenant and broke them, for the covenant had been broken by the nation, specifically, no other gods and no idols. Then he burnt the golden calf, spread the ashes on the waters, and made the people drink it, a foretaste of the bitterness idolatry would bring them. In verses 21 through 24, when he confronted Aaron about it, we get a classic example of minimizing your own participation in a problem. Moses said, what did the people do to you that you allowed this to happen? Aaron responded, Well, you know the people. It was their idea. I threw the gold in the fire, and out came this calf, like it was a miracle from God. In Exodus 32, 25-35, Moses offered the people a chance to repent, and his tribe, the Levites, came over as a group which caused them to be chosen to take care of the tabernacle. However, their first ministry task was to kill all who refused to repent. When the Mosaic Covenant was put into effect at Sinai, 3,000 Israelites refused to repent and found death. But when the later New Covenant was put into effect, 3,000 Israelites repented, were baptized, and found life. This is why Paul contrasted the two covenants as ministries of life versus death. While God allowed the rebellious adults to live, as they had children to raise, individuals are accountable for their own sins and do not inherit the guilt of others. Accountability was still to come later, and their inclinations would later resurface when they refused to enter Canaan, again rejected Moses and Joshua, and expressed the desire to return to Egypt and were forced to wander in the wilderness until all of the adults above the age of 20, when they left Egypt, were dead. Rather than an isolated incident, the golden calf and return to Egypt episode at Sinai was really emblematic of the general attitude of that generation of Israelites. They apparently did not remember the promises to Abraham and the revealed timetable, did not want to be Yahweh's special people, and did not want to move into Canaan. In Exodus 5, 
Having to gather their own straw made them angry with Moses, claiming that Pharaoh wanted to kill them. In Exodus 14, many expressed that they never wanted to leave Egypt. In Exodus 16, they grumbled, missed Egyptian food, thought they had been led out into the wilderness to die. In Exodus 17, why did you bring us out here to die of thirst in the wilderness? In Numbers 11, they remembered Egyptian food, how well off they were in Egypt, and why did we ever leave? In Numbers 13 and 14, we will see that they were unwilling to enter Canaan. They rejected the positive attitude of Joshua and Caleb and believed the pessimistic nonsense of the ten spies, assumed they'd be better off dead or back in Egypt. In Numbers 20, they said, You brought us here to die. There's no good food here. In Numbers 21, Why did you bring us out to die? No food or water except yuck manna. To their kids, ready to follow Joshua into Canaan, Moses reminded them that their parents had been stubborn and rebellious since the day they left Egypt, and the generation of adults that left Egypt continued to carry idols with them during their 40 years of wilderness wandering. In Exodus 33, 1-6, God told them to depart from Sinai for Canaan, and his angel would go before them to drive out the Canaanites due for judgment but he would not be in their midst because of their stubbornness and the ornaments they had worn celebrating the golden calf. In verses 7 through 11, Moses set up the tent, apparently a temporary meeting place before the tabernacle was finished, outside the camp, because God was fed up with the obstinate attitude of the people and did not want to be in their midst. But God's presence in the pillar of cloud would appear before the tent and communicate with Moses face to face, and Joshua remained at the tent. In Exodus 33:12 through 34:10, Moses was special to God and wanted to see God more clearly than in a cloud pillar. So God told him to cut two replacement stone tablets, come up on the mountain, and he would rewrite the covenant on them. Moses did so, and as he passed by, God described himself as compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, full of loving kindness and truth, a faithful covenant keeper, willing to forgive rebellion, twisted, perverted acts, and missing the mark. But he will punish the guilty who refuse to repent, and he will allow the evil effects of sin to carry on and impact three or four generations. In effect, our sins do hurt others and can corrupt families and even nations for several generations, so consider how your choices will affect others. In Exodus 34, 9 and 10, Moses admitted that the people were obstinate, but he asked God to forgive and continue to be with the people, which he said he would do. But what God would do with the Hebrews would be unique and fearful. In verses 11 through 28, God summarized the covenant and instructions for Israel's conquest of Canaan again. This occurred over a period of 40 days, and we are reminded that the Sinai covenant was the Ten Commandments made with Moses and Israel. In verses 29 through 35, this time Aaron and the people saw Moses' face glowing because he had been in God's presence and they reacted with respect and were submissive. In Exodus 35 and 36, Moses called the people to make free will offerings of the things received from the Egyptians to use in building the tabernacle, and workers were called to offer their skills, with two men given spiritual gifts for construction. In chapters 36 through 39, Moses recorded a lot of specifics about building the tabernacle. In chapter 40, verses 34 to 38, the tabernacle was set up, and God showed his acceptance of it by filling the tent with the cloud of his Shekinah glory, after which the cloud by day and fire by night remained over the tabernacle. When the cloud or fire moved, the Israelites packed up and moved with it. In Numbers 10:11. 
After a year at Mount Sinai, the cloud began to move, and the Israelites moved with it. Moses asked his brother-in-law to go along as a native scout, which he apparently did. In Numbers 11, 1 through 34, the people complained about the manna, which is described, and there's no meat, so they were given quail coming out their noses. But God also hit the outskirts of the camp with plague and fire. Moses complained about the load, and God told him to get some help. The 70 elders may have been the origin of the Sanhedrin. In chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron complained about Moses' wife, Zipporah, probably for defending Moses. And God defended Moses by giving Miriam a temporary dose of leprosy. There's no evidence for a second wife, and Habakkuk 3.7 equated Midian with Kushan. New Testament writers warned readers to not imitate Israel's ongoing complaints and rebellion. In Numbers 13 and 14, Israel moved from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, and from there 12 spies were sent in to investigate Canaan. When they returned, they first gave an accurate report. Caleb encouraged proceeding with the conquest, and then the pessimists chimed in. Well, we can't defeat the Canaanites. The land swallows its inhabitants. All the people were giants. What a bunch of pessimistic fiction. They have seen God decimate Egypt and Pharaoh's army. Canaan's fortified cities and armies were nothing by comparison. The land did not devour its inhabitants, for they admitted that there were lots of Canaanites living there, and all of the spies returned. Finally, all the Canaanites are giants? Hardly. They only saw three giants near Hebron. The real problem is they do not want to conquer Canaan. They want to go back to Egypt. So the people whined and complained all night. Then in the morning, grumbled against Moses and Aaron, asserted that they would be killed invading Canaan, so they needed to return to Egypt and wanted to select a leader to take them back. Joshua and Caleb reasserted that they could take the land, but the people were ready to stone Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. God's glory appeared and said he was fed up with them, ready to destroy them all and start over with Moses. Moses interceded for them, noting to God how it would look to others, and he reminded God of his merciful nature. Well, God relented, but he said that Canaan's door was closed for 40 years of wandering until everyone above the age of 20 when they left Egypt, except for Joshua and Caleb, died in the wilderness, and the ten spies who fostered this pessimism were killed. In 1439-45, the people suddenly had a change of heart and were ready to enter Canaan, but the door was closed, and the Amalekites and Canaanites drove them back. Lesson? Opportunities are not available forever, and once God closes a door, do not try to kick it open. In Numbers 15, 32-36, a man was caught violating the Sabbath by gathering firewood so he was killed for violating the Sabbath. That may have triggered Korah's rebellion against Moses and Aaron in chapters 16 and 17. This has been around since the time of Cain, Genesis 4. People who are not offended by crime, but outraged at the idea of punishing criminals. Ecclesiastes 8.11 contains pretty solid logic that liberals have always wanted to ignore until their family is victimized by a repeat offender. In chapters 16 and 17, Korah's rebellion was a challenge to Moses and Aaron's spiritual leadership. It involved a number of leading Levites who now want to be priests. The every member priesthood was offered at Sinai. Why didn't they want it then? So the leaders of the rebellion were swallowed by the earth. Then Aaron and the Levite's special role was again confirmed as Aaron's staff alone sprouted, put forth buds, that blossomed and produced ripe almonds. In Numbers 20, 1 through 13, we again have complaints about a lack of water. This time, God told Moses to speak to the rock, but Moses claimed that he was the one bringing forth the water and struck the rock rather than speaking to it. 
For this, Moses would not lead Israel into the Promised Land. Disobedience? Yes. But with Moses and Aaron both dying outside the land, this may be another typology. God's people did not enter the Promised Land following Moses, Sinai covenant law-keeping, or Aaron, a human priesthood, but by following Yehoshua, in Greek, Jesus, in English, Joshua, or Jesus. In verses 14 to 21, Edom refused to let Israel pass through, and Israel was told to avoid conflict with them. In verses 22 through 29, Aaron died at Mount Hor. Now, this is near Edom, so it is not Horeb or Sinai. In Numbers 21, 1 through 3, some Canaanites attacked and were destroyed. In 21, 4 through 9, avoiding Edom, the people complained and serpents bit the people. Now, rather than remove the serpents, God told Moses to make a bronze serpent, lift it up on a pole, and whoever looked to the one accursed and lifted on a pole would be cured. This is also typology pointing to Jesus. Looking in faith to the one who was accursed and lifted on a pole brings healing from our sin problem. In verses 21 through 35, the Amorites east of the Jordan were conquered. First, King Sihon, centered in Heshbon, refused Israel passage, and his territory was conquered. Then King Og in Bashan was defeated. Remember, in the earlier promises to Abraham, it was the Amorites that were primarily to be targeted for judgment at this time. After the first generation of Israelites refused to enter Canaan, we can summarize the next 40 years as follows. Beginning at Kadesh Barnea, they spent time camped in several locations. Eventually, they moved north with instructions to avoid conflict with Edom, Moab, and Ammon, who were not slated for judgment. They destroyed the Amorites west of Ammon, ruled by Sihon, then moved north to defeat King Og and the Amorites in Bashan. They then moved south and camped on the plains of Moab across the Jordan from Jericho, where Moses would die and Joshua would soon lead them into Canaan. In Numbers 22.1, the second generation of Hebrews were now camped on the plains of Moab opposite Jericho. In the rest of chapters 22 through 24, Moab's king, Balak, was concerned that Israel might now move against his land, so he hired Balaam, a prophet for prophet, to curse Israel. But God would not allow him to speak curses, only blessings. So in chapter 25 at Peor, Moabites invited Israel to a feast celebrating Canaanite gods. Some Midianite women were involved, and Phinehas, protecting the tabernacle, killed two that were having ritual sex in the tabernacle, and later Balaam was killed for being the brains behind and plotting the idolatrous feast at Peor. The book of Numbers was named for the two censuses taken before and after the 40 years of wandering. When the Hebrews were servants under grace in Egypt, their numbers kept increasing. At Sinai, Israel's men numbered 603,550. But after 40 years of wandering and rebelling under law, their numbers had dropped to 601,730. It's better to be a servant under grace than a rebel under law. In Numbers 26, 52 to 65, there is a summary of the tribe of Levi and all who died in the wilderness. In Numbers 27, 12 through 23, Moses would see the land and then die. His authority was transferred to Joshua. In Numbers 31, vengeance on the Midianites for participating in the sin at Peor. In Numbers 32, Reuben and Gad wanted to settle on land east of the Jordan, and it caused a brief problem when suggested that they would not help the other tribes conquer Canaan, west of the Jordan. But they promised to help, and followed through on it later. In Numbers 33, 1-49, Israel's conquests so far are recounted, and in Numbers 34, we have information about dividing the land between the tribes.